I'm meteorologist Laura Thomas. Thanks for logging on to ABC15.com. Thanks for logging on to ABC15.com. I'm meteorologist Iris Hermosillo. After a nice weekend, we're heating back up. Temperatures today topped 118. Begin with the olive oil. The last time we topped 120 was back in 1991. We're nearing the triple digits and records also in jeopardy the next couple of days. And Tuesday, 119, the forecasted high tomorrow. The record is 116. Back when we hit 122 degrees, the airport famously shut down. It's not looking too shabby. So a warmer to hot day across the state. In September of 2017, Vice News published an article online that claimed Phoenix would not be a place to live by the year 2050 due to climate change. I'm a little skeptical. What are we going to do when Phoenix is not going to be the place we are used to? Although the scientific community is very familiar with how dire and substantial the effects of climate change can be on a global scale, Never has an article been as bold as Vice News has with this claim. The one thing we know about predicting the future is that it's always wrong. Chingwen Chang and Andrew Maynard are both sustainability experts at Arizona State University with diverse backgrounds in understanding the effects of climate change. When I start looking at the climate change impacts, that's how I started looking at flooding hazards, extreme weathers and uh, who will be impacted most. Coming to Arizona was a totally bizarre experience. So as you'll gather, I come from the UK, so I'm used to cold, wet, cloudy, dull weather and days. And you don't get that much of that here in Arizona. Um, so I must confess before I came here, this was one of the things that concerned me the most. How would I cope with the heat and the sunshine? Phoenix uh, is a relatively new city uh, compared to other American cities. Uh, probably since like 1950s, we really started this kind of modern city ideal. So how do we adapt to an environment where it's going to get hotter and hotter over the next uh, couple of decades or so? It's a really tough question. And of course, we could say that it's going to be possible to develop technologies that make this possible. But for the day-to-day -day use, I think we don't get enough incentive to conserve every day. Our water bill is relatively cheap, and our uh, water infrastructure, um, it, it's kind of reliable. People actually don't think about it. If you have people that can pay for them, you can imagine the technologies will develop but they will exclude people that can't actually afford them. So, and, and what is even worse here is the people that will be able to afford these technologies will be mobile populations. They will have the opportunity to move somewhere else and be able to develop a life, get a job elsewhere in the country where it's not going to be as hot. The people that are doubly disadvantaged are those communities that can't afford to move, can't afford the new technologies. My name is Barbara Lukowitz. I'm the executive director of Justice Center. Justice Center is a day resource center for seniors experiencing homelessness. And in fact, we're the only homeless day resource center for seniors in the United States. The Justice Center is one of dozens of homeless shelters in Phoenix that give the homeless a place of refuge from the streets. Barbara claims that anywhere between 130 to 180 members of the homeless population will seek refuge at Justice Center on a daily basis. So the way that homeless combat heat in Arizona is actually trying to find places of refuge, that's the term that I would use. And that place of refuge can be a day resource center like Justice Center. It could be a public library, um, or it could be maybe a, a a church or a faith community that's opening up its doors during the time of extreme heat. What you always want to remember is that people who are 55 and older are much more prone to heat stress and heat stroke than any other uh, population. Many have been through this place of refuge's doors and many stories permeate through the walls of this shelter. I was here and I had seen the nurse and I was work, trying to get work, working on getting my medications because I'd been without my medications for a while. So I'd been trying to get my medications. And th they noticed that and I'd been trying to take care of this too, what's on my arms and stuff, which was, like I said, way worse than what it is now. This is Clifford Heath. He lives on the streets with his wife and had suffered a burning amount of exposure to the sun a week before I spoke to him. 
It's been four days since he was released from St. Joseph's Hospital. So I went in to the emergency room. I had to wait my turn. When I got up to my turn, I told the lady, I said, I need to sit down before I fall down. And she said, well, go ahead and go ahead and sit down. Don't fall down, please. Probably about five or six minutes later, while I was talking to her, I ended up telling her, uh, ma'am, I'm having a problem. I said, I don't think I'm going to make it. And then after that, I, I couldn't remember anything after that, after they talked to me a couple times in the emergency room. But that's the last thing I remember, like I said, for three days. And then I finally got out last Sunday out of the hospital. That's basically what happened with me, you know, and the sun had a lot to do with it. And, and the heat had a lot to do with it. You know, the, the heat here is going to kill people. I ended up homeless because my monies, um, I, had, I have a lot of uh, disabilities on my back. I was trying to obtain my disability social security. That wasn't panning through and not being able to work. Um, I lost everything. I lost my apartment, my vehicles, everything I had. Everything. Rudy Solis hasn't been homeless in years, but even though he has a job now, working for the shelter that once sheltered him all those years ago, his memories of being homeless are still fresh in his mind. In between that, for about two and a half years, I struggled out in the streets. Um, I walked the streets nights, days, cold, rainy, hot, uh, backpack on me. I would go down to a truck stop on 67 and ask the truck drivers, for a shower, they would give me. A, they would get tokens and give me a shower. I would get a shower there, and I'd be able to get my hygiene clean. Um, they sometimes help me so I can get my laundry done. But most of the time, I was out just hanging out places like going into Walmart's, Waterburgers, places they already knew me, Filibertos, to stay out of the streets. I was engaged to be married a year ago, and his sister didn't approve of him getting married, didn't think he could afford it. So she came down from Snowflake and took him back up there. And then the, we were going to get married and live in his condominium, and then she sold that, and so I had no place to go. So I ended up homeless. So um, here I am at Justice Center a year later. The reality is that this is not only a, a complex challenge, but it's a deeply integrated challenge. There's a variety of nonprofits and faith communities that will open their doors and people can come in and, you know, be in air conditioning and that's going to be a great help. The city itself has been very good about making sure that there's water available. Um, but organizations and individuals have to be good about contributing to that. And so I think that um, the best way we're going to be able to combat it, have more places of refuge, but ultimately we need to build more safe and affordable housing units so that these people are not on the streets. The community needs to be able to step up and, and say, hey, let's tell, make, make it easier for people to get into an apartment complex or into a housing because it's a struggle for a lot of us. It's a struggle to be able to get yourself out of the streets. Once you become homeless, it's like a hundred times harder to come out of it than it was when you went in. Because now you're dealing with your mental, your health, and fighting for you, for you to be able to get somewhere to live again. There used to be a television show called The Naked City, and the closing voiceover was, there are a million stories in the city, and this has been one. And that's what I feel like it is with us. Everyone has a different story and a different reason for ending up homeless. And it's uh, so many people in the world are like one or two paychecks away from this. You know, I mean, if they lose their job or something happens and they can't maintain their home, you know, that uh, you can end up like this without even planning for it or knowing it's going to happen. To this day, the Justice Center still provides the homeless with shelter from the heat. And even though the future is cloudy, it doesn't look like Arizona will be cloudy anytime soon. Phoenix and its community continues to hope that as time moves forward, the city will be okay.